Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final session for today's series of presentations. Uh, we've had a great range of presentations today, and we've been uh, really glad with the feedback that we've had throughout our sessions as well. Before we get started with our final presentation, just like to take the opportunity again to thank our sponsors of National Safety Month. We've got over $10,000 worth of giveaways throughout the month of October, and by tuning in today, you get an additional entry into that drawer as well. We'd also like to thank Garmin, who's the gold sponsor of National Safety Month and the sponsor of today's presentations. They'll be joining us tomorrow afternoon for a demonstration of their products, but you can find out more from www.com garmin.com just as a bit of housekeeping uh, on the right hand side of your screen you should have a QA and a panel that pops up uh, we'd love for you to throw in there any questions that you've got for today's presentation if that chat box is not open that Q&A box uh, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen you should see a blue chat button if you hit that it should open that panel and allow you to throw your questions in there I uh, would love any feedback and questions throughout, uh, which we're more than happy to answer. So uh, on that note, I will bring in this afternoon's discussion panellists and uh, start our conversation. G'day, Dan. G'day. <laughs> How are you going? Good, good. And g'day, Tim. How are we doing? Good. Yourselves? Very good, good. indeed. Excellent. I've been looking forward to this discussion. I think it's going to be a good one and hopefully uh, some good takeaways for our members as well. So in relation to this, uh, the format of this is going to be fairly casual. We're just going to have a little bit of a chat about bush flying. Uh, like I mentioned, if anyone's got any questions as we go throughout, chuck them up there in the chat. Uh, these guys know everything about bush flying. So, you know, <laughs> they'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, but yeah, that's the one. But to uh, get started, let's do some introductions. Um, who are you for those that might not be aware already? You start, Dan. All right. Okay. Um, Dan Compton. Uh, I um, operate near Dubbo with a little business called Wings Out West, just uh, teaching people to fly recreationally. Um, I started flying back in 1987 when I was 16. Went on and did my commercial pilot's license um, by 1991. Uh, really wanted to get in the Air Force, so I went back to school and did my HSC and got in the Air Force. Um, did that until I did that from 1996 until 2008. And then came up here to Dubbo and flew for the Flying Doctor Service for a few years. And then um, became a sort of a live at home dad with an RAOS flying school. Um, I. Uh, yeah, so it sort of sounds like a backwards career, but it's actually, for me, it's been really good. And, and in fact, I love my cubs. I, I had my first cub a bit over 20 years ago. And in my little flying school here, I get to operate the cubs. I get to do my bush flying. And um, I actually find that it's probably the most satisfying bit of my flying career I've ever had. So, um, yeah, that's who I am and why I do what I do. And, well, I'm Tim Howes. Um, I'm a passionate RALs pilot, a huge fan of RALs, and I fly bush planes. Um, I, no, no, nothing elaborate for me, um, but yeah, really about the only flying I do is bush and off airport flying. I Most years when uh, certain circumstances aren't around, I go to the States each year. Uh, I'm one of the original Flying Cowboys with Kevin Quinn. Um, also a member of the Stole Rats, one of the uh, founders of Stole Drag. And, and um, yeah, the founder in Australia, I'm the founder of Bush Flies Down Under, the Facebook group. Absolutely. So we've got a lot of experience in this room uh, in relation to bush flying. So, uh, yeah, we're really glad that you guys could join us for, uh, for our discussion. So to kick things off, I guess, at the heart of it, what is bush flying? Well, look, do, Dan, do you want to take this one? Or? <laughs> 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 well, look, bush flying is basically anything. And, and Dan and I did actually have a conversation before we started this. And um, bush flying is just taking your plane anywhere that's, I guess, really not a major centre. It's not necessarily meaning not going to an airport. It's just uh, basically operating an aircraft anywhere where, I guess you could say, you've got minimal assistance. Now, 
through there, we you can basically ca- um, split bush flying in two categories, uh, both sharing a lot of skills though. One being uh, bush strip flying, and uh, the other being off airport flying, uh, which is the real passion for Dan and I. Um, but look, really, most of the skills will relate to both. Uh, it's at the end of the day, uh, a runway is just a convenient place to land an aeroplane. So the skills in preparing to uh, land an aircraft in an unprepared environment is uh, generally shared no matter where you land. Absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's key there. This not only applies to those who are really landing in remote locations, but it applies to people who are landing on their own farm strips. Um, and, and other than centres that um, that are managed and, and use standard ALAs. Dan, did you have anything else to add to that one? Yeah, that's pretty much in agreement with Tim. If bush flyings, you know, just getting out away from the major centres and then and then deeper into bush flyings, getting that off airport. Of course, there are a lot of uh, strips, you know, as you come out into the country or no, even around some of the major centres, you'll find strips that I would probably call bush flying, you know, like, You've got to modify your approach to land there. Um, it's not very well prepared or unprepared, um, stuff like that. And um, if I was going to add anything um, beyond what Tim said, um, I'd say uh, with bush flying, I like to think of it, uh, I like to extend it to a term a friend in Alaska years called, where he called it survival flying. So if you get into the bush flying, like um, e- even in outback Australia, but New Zealand, Alaska, all these places, it's about heading out from and, and planning to be able to operate anywhere in a survivable way, as opposed to planning, like most people do, to fly from one airport to the next in the hope that nothing goes wrong in the middle. Um, we plan, it's not, for us, it's not something going wrong that we'll land somewhere in the middle, but the great thing is, is that we're never afraid. If, if we are flying from one airport to another, we're happy with what's in the middle as well. So that's that's what I like about bush flying. Yeah, yeah bush flying is probably more so than the act of flying. It's a skill set. Is probably what bush flying is more than anything. Yeah, I think that's the key to cover off today. Is that there's a range of skills uh, that bush flying really teaches you and allows you to to hone down as a pilot. Uh, but also on the flip side, there's additional risks as well that need to be taken into account. Uh, so that's really key. So I guess the next point is, if I'm a, a new RPC holder, uh, just started flying, how do I get involved in bush flying? What's What does that process look like? Well, okay. the, 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 I'll, I'll start on this one and then I'm going to hand it over to Dan. The first thing is is learning the skills. It is finding someone who can identify to you what the skills are you need to learn, and that's not YouTube videos. Uh, there are plenty of guys who have bent, um, bent their planes already trying to, you know, pioneer things. You don't need to do that now. So find someone who can identify the skills you need to learn and then find someone who can teach them to you. Now... With the surge of bush flying, it's fantastic. It's really taking off at the moment. We're seeing a lot of it, but that means that every second flying school at the moment is offering bush flying training. One of the most important things I tell people is find out from that instructor, actually find out what their off airport or bush flying experience is before you start going down that avenue because we're seeing a lot of flying schools around the world at the moment selling bush flying where they're just landing on a 900 meter grass strip that is completely prepared and maintained so find out what their experience is and um someone like dan who for me is up there i don't know if i'm pointing in the right spot for you guys but dan has done training in alaska with one of the best off airport flying schools in the world um and multiple times too so you know when you start finding that out you start thinking okay i can listen to what this guy has to say and take it on from there dan those skills are <laughs> <laughs> um yeah sorry i just um tim's overwhelming with embarrassment with embarrassment there but yeah that's that's yeah that, he's right though like and and i don't want to sort of sell my own business here or anything but 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 um yeah i think i think it's important when you want to get into something new like any any sport or anything try and look for the real expertise i guess um i mean just getting in like 
any group's good, but um, just be careful, you know, nut out the where the real expertise is coming from. So, you know, I guess it's like any error club situation. You can walk into the error club and there'll be a certain amount of people loitering at the bar and I call them spotters, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, they haven't really gone out and got the experience, but they're full of expertise and advice. Um, so you sort of just got to sift through and find um, where the, the real stories are coming from and, um, and look for the people who are honest and will um, tell you about the accidents they've had getting to this point and stuff like that. You know, and I've had some and, you know, there's, um, yep, <laughs> I've got some spare parts in the back, you know, or some, some bent parts out the back of the hangar and stuff. And, and you know, and that's, that's the kind of stuff you need to hear about. You need to know that it doesn't come for free, uh, that, that, you know, you need to work on it and, um, you know, you need, you need the hard facts. It, I guess it's, um, to use a really bad example, I guess it's, it'd be like thinking about, you know, starting a family and talking to someone who's never started a family before. You know, you, for, for the, for the for particularly for the lady, she really wants to talk to some mums who have had a baby, you know, not, not you know, and stuff like that. Like, it, it's, that's, that's taking it to a severe example, I guess, but, um, and, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but it's, you really want you really want to seek the right advice of the people who have who have um, uh, who've got the experience. Um, that being said, then you know just get into it, yeah, um, and start trying things carefully, you know. And um, yeah, some of it you can go out and learn by yourself and just practice. But yeah, we'll come to that in a little while. But yeah, that's that's the key there for sure is uh, immersing yourself with people who know what they're talking about. Um, and going out there, starting small, don't expect to be going and, and landing off crazy strips in, in the middle of nowhere uh, right off the bat. Um, go out and spend some time with an instructor uh, to really build those skills because they are a different skill set that, than what you will learn in your RPC, which really is focused at, at landing at, uh, at fairly well-serviced airports. So on that note, uh, I guess, Dan, what um, what are the training requirements in, in terms of bush flying or what type of training can you do? Yeah, so training requirements, zero. Like there isn't, at the moment, there's not an endorsement or anything setting down a training requirement. What can you do? Um, I, I like to recommend um, people do a low-level endorsements handy, um, not because you have to have one, but if you think about it logically, um, even when we go out and do practice like precautionary search and landing, um, if a person stuck in that situation where they're going to purposefully land an aeroplane under power, um, but not in an airport, um, you're going to essentially, you know, well, when we're teaching it, they're going to go down below 500 feet inspecting a strip and stuff like that. So if you're not in an airport, you're essentially low flying. And that. So um, when I ring up Jill and, or email Jill and ask for another low-level endorsement to be approved, um, usually that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking at people who have come to me keen to do bush flying or, or that, and I say, let's start with a low-level endorsement because that's um, probably, you know, once, you're, once an aircraft's on the ground, there's a whole bunch of hazards on the ground, but a lot of those it won't kill you. But the bit where you try and transition from our safe above 500 foot AGL to on the ground where we're not in an airport environment, there's a bunch of things that will kill us um, and that. So um, it's not required, but a low level endorsement or that kind of training is really handy. Um, once you've crossed through that barrier of um, I'm, I now know how to get down there into a, a danger zone um, amongst power lines, dead trees, um, rotors over trees, hills, and other obstacles that they generally don't put around airports, um, other than Canberra and Essendon. Um, the the um, the then then we can start talking about the skill set required to land in these areas, and um, we'll cover this again in this discussion. But the skill set required to land in the areas are really a, a, a honing what you should already know. It's it's that loose set of stuff that your instructor should have covered in your training, but being that the RAO syllabus 
you know, it's kind of we're working on that promise that you can keep the person in as little as 20 hours. It's, you know, really a, a fresh RPC pilot doesn't have a whole um, lot, you know, they probably, they, they remember the instructor talking about something about landing on an aim point or something like that, but they're probably not very good at it. Um, admittedly, if they've come to me for a low-level endorsement, they should at least have 50 hours in command. But even with 50 hours in command, they probably, they've only been flying at an airport with a big runway probably, and they haven't honed into what's going to be required of them in the bush. But yeah, so requirement, zero. Um, what I like to see people do, yeah, low-level endorsement. Now let's start working on your skill, just, you know, getting things a little bit more accurate. Um, there are some other skills like um, we will land uphill, you know, for example. Um, that's that's different than most airports and things like that. So there, there's little there, there's little things that need to be taught. You can't just oh well you can, but you're taking a big risk if you just go out and try that first time by yourself with, with op, you know optical illusions and things like that. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's great. My, my short answer long. <laughs> well, one of one of the biggest things is also probably even more in, important than the flying itself is learning to determine, determine the suitability of where you're going to land as well. Um, it, it's funny you actually plan everything to do with your landing in reverse. You start with your takeoff. Can I get out of there? You know, you start then you move down to can I park the aeroplane when I'm on the ground? You know, you start looking at all these things before you come down to planning. Can I land there? You know, it's um, there's no point landing there if you can't get back out. So it's um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's one of the big things. Probably even more more important than the flying itself is is the suitability. Yeah, I think that's that's the key differentiation here is that whilst there might not be a, a specific endorsement to go and do this type of flying, it doesn't mean to say you just jump in your aircraft and go out there because it's it's definitely a different skill set. Uh, compared to that and like you say with the the RPC syllabus is really equipped uh, for that basic essential knowledge of at landing at a prepared aerodrome it really doesn't equip someone with additional skills uh, you know for for a range of of other flying uh, not just bush flying but uh, operating in terms of you know farm flying and inspection flying and, and all these other kind of things where there's uh there's other risks to consider as well so and, and by uh, Talking to people who do it and um, and who have done a lot of it and instructors who do it themselves and have extensive experience in it and having them demonstrate it to you before you start learning, you learn the most important thing of all and that's learning how to identify what you don't know. And that's more key than what you do know is learning how to know when something's out of your skill set or you don't have the ability to do it. Absolutely. For sure. We'll touch more on some of this uh, very soon. But the next question that I posed to you guys uh, before we did this was, what type of aircraft do you need to do this type of flying? Can you use any aircraft? Yes. What aircraft can you get the most out of? That's really <laughs> it's, the big question. Yeah. It, it's Look, um, it. I saw a film uh, the other day, High Sierra Flying. Tim and I have both been over there. And um, they land on top of a hill there. And, and unfortunately, when you look at it on Facebook or YouTube, this hill they're landing on, they call Outlook, it looks pretty tame. Like, in fact, two years after I went there, I saw a video of someone landing on it the other day and I thought, oh, I can't believe that's Outlook. Like, it, it's, it's, well, for starters, it's a very high altitude. So that's something that you don't catch in the videos, the fact that they're landing on a hill at a very high altitude. So they've got a big TAS landing on that hill for starters. But then it's a lot more limited than it looks on video too. Like things, the way camera lenses work, everything looks a lot wider and flatter and everything. But in fact, they're landing on this little ridge line that's often got seven aircraft parked on it already. And um, it was really good to see someone go in there the other day and land a Cessna 172 at, at Outlook. And I thought, well, there you go. That's, that's just what we're talking about right now because traditionally the only aircraft you'd be seeing landing on that hill would be high-powered cubs and stuff, things that have got the um, the flap and everything to at least get their TAS, their TAS down to a speed at that high-density altitude to be able to land on this ridgeline. Um, and things that have got the power to get back off that ridgeline um, without 
you know, going where the hill drops away from the aeroplane, the aeroplane then just dropping down into the ground sort of thing. Um, and to see this guy be brave enough to take a 172 in there, or silly enough, it was kind of good, you know. It, it, at least he didn't roll it up in a ball. Um, but that's the thing. You can use any kind of aeroplane for bush flying, but the caveat, you must limit what you do to the aeroplane. Like, firstly, always have your limits, but then with the aeroplane, then you've got to apply its limits. So if, if my limits are, oh, I can land in a riverbed with my cub, then when I get in a, um, like a Fayetta or something, I, I won't necessarily, I won't go out and do the same thing in that. It's got, you know, short undercarriage, low wings, you know, and stuff like that. So I'm not going to land that aircraft in the same place I land my cub, but I may still land it somewhere interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And going back to that 172, you know, I always say it's the aircraft that you can get the most out of and that you, that you know the best. Now that same pilot may have landed that aircraft, that 172 there, and it's all big and amazing. Does that mean is there any good in a cub on bush wheels? You know, the ultimate plane for the job, that doesn't necessarily mean he has the skill set and the experience to repeat it in the more capable aircraft. So it's really about the pilot and their familiarity more so than the aircraft itself. Yep. There's those two, two sets of limits. Oh, and of course, there's the overarching rules about everything. But, you know, when we're getting down to this, where there's not a lot of rules, I guess, pilot limits, aircraft limits, match the two together and then see where you go. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, and the pilot understanding uh, the limitations of that aircraft in particular. Um, yep. But also, I'm sure the both of you, uh, if you were jumping into a new type of aircraft uh, that you might know on paper is capable of doing these things, also wouldn't take it into uh, the extent of that limitation until you're uh, familiar with that aircraft as well. I got the privilege of having a fly of Steve Henry's Yeehaw 4, one of the most... Uh, you know, capable of aircraft, airport aircraft that's ever been made. And I was nervous flying that thing in and out of Boise, you know, in Idaho. Um, it, well, I wasn't familiar with it. It was a side-by-side. I put all, all my flying tandem. You know, everything was so different. So just because that plane could, also Yamaha engine, never flown one of them before, just because that plane could do it, I was more out of my depth than I've ever been before. You know, two minutes before we were landing in six feet on the top of the you know, tiny little knoll when he was uh, at, the, at the controls. So, because the plane can do it, I couldn't. So, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the, the key right there for sure. So, moving on to the next question, and uh, we have had a question from Neil as well. Where is it legal to land off airport? Um, and the next question we had was, can I land an aircraft just anywhere? Now, obviously, there's a bunch of, uh, of requirements in relation to this question, and uh, it's important that pilots go and check out their legal obligations as well. But uh, the key is that, obviously, the location must be suitable for takeoff and for landing uh, before you look at, at anything like that. But you must also have landowner permission to operate out of that location, uh, which is key. But uh, do you guys have anything else to add to, to that? What, what you just said, Cody covers the, the legalities of it, really. Um, for Tim and I to try and break down all of the different scenarios that fit those legalities is just too extensive and too easy for us to um, put our foot in it. Um, but, yeah, so landowner permission and you must it must be deemed suitable. So, um, yeah, people think about it. Um, if your wreckage is sitting in a place that obviously was a really bad decision to try and land there. CASA, the insurance company, everybody can say, you, you can say, well, I had permission to do this, but then they're going to say, well, how did you deem this suitable? And that question's going to come up. Usually not really a big problem. If nobody's hurt and you've just wrecked your aeroplane and you cried, it's not going to be too big a deal. But if you hurt someone doing that, it's going to turn into a big deal. If their family's trying to sue you, it's going to turn into a big deal about how you deem that suitable. So, yeah, I'll go out by myself and occasionally land somewhere that, um, you know, if I stuffed it up, I, I, I wouldn't doubt some uh, a bureaucratic minded person coming out and looking at that and measuring it with a tape measure and saying this was not suitable. Um, that's fine by myself and, you know, everything. But, um, yeah, that, so, yeah, 
long story short, the two things you said, Katie. Um, the answer effectively is no, you can't just land it anywhere. You can't just um, land anywhere. Um, but it does get complicated, especially when you start talking about national parks and, and all sorts of other things which are, uh, are typically totally off limits. Uh, but the landowner permission is, is also key yeah. there. The other side of the coin, though, depending how you read that question, is I would also say that you could land an aircraft anywhere. And, and I mean physically. And when they say every landing is one that you can walk away from, a good landing is one that you walk away from. Well, when you go that angle, the development of these skill sets of bush flying, even if you have no intention of going out and landing on a farm or landing in a paddock or landing on a ridge top, from a purely safety point of view, Dan and I have said that many times we never fly anywhere and think that if our engine were to stop now, we're dead. You know, we, we, we can safely fly our aircraft. And I would say the majority of aircraft, using the skill set that we've developed to a point that, okay, if we are going to go in, we're going to go in in a way that we're going to, the, the plane's going to be smart and stuff, but we're going to be okay. Um, and with all the preparations that we take for our remote area and unprepared flying, you know, we, we've got the best chances any pilot's ever going to have. Um, so, yeah, in, from, from that other angle, yes, you can potentially land an aircraft anywhere, provided you have the right skills and the right aircraft for the job. Yeah, and that's, so, so yeah, legality is aside, practically speaking, emergent, going back to my survival flying piece, um, I've got a great little, I, I like collecting pictures of cubs in trees um, because around the world, especially in America and, uh, you know, Alaska and that, a lot of cubs end up in the proper trees. And, um, and it's just, it just proves that point. If you have to, you can do it. And, you know, I say to all my students, if you have to, just just land it. You know, if, it, if it's solid trees, just come in, picture the top of the trees as the landing surface, flare, land, don't undo your seatbelt. Like, just set your beacon off and wait for the helicopter. But but the thing is, is, yeah, if, um, but once again, aircraft and can yeah. I think uh, that's that's the saying I like in terms of uh, engine failures in particular is that engine failures or sorry forced landings are there to protect people uh, and to save people, not airplanes. Uh, you're always better to put the airplane into a position where the aircraft is going to be destroyed, but you manage to walk away from it at the end of the day. And uh, it's it's certainly true to say that some of the skills that the both of you have, have developed through bush flying um, is, is certainly going to assist in areas like that. Jill's just sent me a message as well saying, land as far into the accident as possible. Um, that's that's exactly right. So, how did you get out of it? <laughs> absolutely. And uh, that ties in nicely to uh, the next question that we've got, which uh, what are the additional risks involved in, in bush flying and landing uh, off your standard prepared airfield? Um, did you want me to start, Tim? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, this, this answer is complicated too. Like, I mean, I kind of consider myself what I'm doing as safe as airport flying. Um, but it's a mentality, that's a mentality answer, you know, like that's, that's my way of thinking. I go, um, unfortunately, like my first instructor and other people I know have died near airport. And so I've got this bit of a psychological bent against airports in some way where I think airports suck people in and pilots fly around near airports and they only ever practice forced landings on airports and I hate seeing these pictures on the news of an aircraft um, stall spin accident into the ground after an engine failure near a runway and you go look at all the beautiful paddocks they were flying over you know so I kind of like to think that my my flying's safe yeah okay Let's be realistic. Um, there are extra extra risks, and I'd say if I was to really attack the simple extra risks, like of the person going out without experience and having a go at bush flying, I'd say it probably comes down to that planning thing, right? What Tim was talking about before. People don't extend themselves out to the future. For example, there are some of these stole aircraft you can buy with their slats and everything. And you can land these things on a dime, but their takeoff performance is terrible, you know. And so I like to get aircraft, like I like my style aircraft, 
to have a takeoff performance that's pretty much matched to the landing performance, um, or a takeoff performance that's better than the landing performance, because the takeoff's the thing that'll often kill people. Once you get an aircraft on the ground and rolling along on the ground, if you go, if you roll beyond your landing into the trees, it's probably not going to kill you, you know. But if you take off and hit the top of a tree or a power line or something in the takeoff, that's probably going to kill you. So, so um, people need to plan just like doing flight planning with bush flying. Um, we, it doesn't come. It doesn't come with an on route supplement. You know, landing in a paddock doesn't come with an on route supplement that tells you how long the runway is, that it meets all the gradient requirements and all this stuff. So people need to plan it and remember um, they've flown all their training with those adages like the runway behind you is a waste. Well, now you're operating on this little tiny bit of runway, so you definitely don't want to waste anything behind you, but even what's in front of you is not much. So where they were always operating on their 5,000-foot runway and not wasting any of it, now they don't have that protection of all that runway underneath them when they take off. So they've got to think about that. When they come in and land and they used to float three quarters of the way down the runway and then tuck down and say, oh, that was a nice landing. It was worth holding off. Well, now they need to remember that they need to be able to judge during their approach that they're going to hit their own point and, and land there. So the extra risks can ultimately be mitigated. You can, you can ultimately... Um, weed out those extra risks with training and experience but early on there is definitely extra risks for the untrained eye so once again um, accept that there are risks but um, the risk at an airport of being listed like have been um, or you know the trees have been cut down this and that they've got an ursa entry so you can read and understand the risk of that airport is there an animal hazard or do the lights work 24 hours a day or whatever? But in bush flying, you have to identify the individual risks of where you're operating. You have to identify your... Um, you have to um, see as your experience grows what you can... Um, how good you are and you, and you work within your limits, the aeroplane's limits and the airfield's limits. But especially what Tim said before, plan, plan, plan. Like, um, yeah, know your way out before you get in there. So, um, yeah. Um, Paul, Paul Klaus Tim? actually had a very good saying he always used to tell me is that whenever landing off airport or, you know, or somewhere unprepared, allow 15 minutes before you, like when you're flight planning, allow 15 minutes before you actually put the plane on the ground to be able to make your planning consider everything, as I said originally, from takeoff to parking area to what direction the sun coming from. Is it going to highlight hazards? What might the wildlife be? If there is wildlife in the area, okay, often you can push it off of the aeroplane, but you don't know how long that's going to take you to do that, you know. Um, to then And then from that point there, you're still, you know, even once you do start getting to see if you can, can physically land there, you need to start doing things like dragging the check the surface this um you know get good inspections because from the air it might look like you have 100 meters to use but there might only be 30 meters usable you know you need to factor all these things in and the other big one you've got to do as well is power out uh, power out on your approaches to check against the altitude what is my takeoff performance going to be you don't know until you try these things so as i said paul klaus always used to say allow 15 minutes you don't have to use it all but if you allow 15 minutes in your flight planning before you put that airplane on the ground, it's never a bad idea. Yep. And um, Tim just touched on one there. I touched on it before too. But um, the with the you know, if we look at bush flying, it do, bush flying doesn't necessarily mean short field. But um, if we look at the bush flying as generally meaning short field or unknown obstacle gradients and that that density altitude thing becomes a lot more important. If you, you know, if two fellows get in a... Well, Cessna 150 is a bad example in RAOs because you won't get two people in one in RAOs. But that kind of low-performance aircraft that's going to have, you know, struggles to make a climb out on a good day, let alone a high-density altitude day, now if you're putting yourself in that situation where, um, you know, off-field, so there can be different gradients you've got to make in that, then... Um, 
there is that heightened risk there. So you need to know your aircraft and you need to do those little tricks to either physically work it out on the day or get into your books and see what the book figures say. Um, the, um, yeah, the, the thing with um, like density altitude problems is that um, you won't find out uh, easily, like if you take off without looking at it, um, you've got to be quick to find that out on the ground that this plane's taking a lot longer to get off the ground. If you put yourself in a situation where there's not much chance to do an abort or something, like you're taking off down a steep hill, um, and you're probably not going to be able to abort, then that's too late to find out that you needed to calculate that before you went. So, so yeah, the, the, risk, the risks are all inherent to flying, really, but we just tighten, we just tightened everything up on ourselves and um, bring bring the risk closer, I guess. Yeah. I guess that comes back uh, to the previous point around, it's about what you don't know when you start this type of flying uh, that becomes key at that point when you've started to fly into somewhere and suddenly realise that, okay, maybe I'm a little bit out of my depth or I didn't consider that. And, and it only comes through experience um, that you guys have where you can start to to get a better understanding as to is that actually a, a suitable place for me to touch down? Is that surface going to be suitable for me to land on? You don't have the guarantees that you do at a standard airport uh, in relation to obstacles. You don't have a windsock necessarily sitting there uh, telling you what the wind direction is. Um, but there's ways that you can build experience to understand what all of those elements are doing on the ground uh, before you actually put yourself in that situation. And I think uh, the aborted takeoff is a key point too, uh, but not only just being committed to, to taking off, but being committed to landing as well. And um, certainly from the much more limited strip flying that I've done in Cubs back in New Zealand, uh, if you're flying into somewhere which is a one-way strip um, and you're on final approach, then, then you need to understand when you're going to make that decision to go around um, ideally before it's it's too late um, because once you cross a certain point you might be committed to landing and uh, if you then adopt the standard RAL's tolerances of of say plus or minus five or ten knots um, then that's not going to be a a suitable uh, variation in airspeed that's going to give you the performance you need to touch down on the spot every time uh, to maintain your safety that's I'm glad you brought that up Katie and and that's the um the one way strip go around and the goes hand in hand with the not being able to abort some takeoffs after a certain point. But um, when I teach my students, you know, uh, in into the one way strip situation or that, um, uh, especially the uphill situation, for example, um, where you're landing on an uphill strip with, with or without trees at the other end, sometimes there's a situation where you can't out climb that hill. So, for starters, you're dealing with a, a lot, well, there's a, a huge amount of problems, but the two problems I'll cover are an uphill strip, oh, I've got to get this, this thing right with the um, screen. An uphill strip, if people are used to landing on a flat strip and they come in at this gradient, if the strip's uphill now, see how that gradient changes, you know, you want to, they, they either want to probably steepen up their approach or at least don't end up coming in um, submarine approach. And so that's a that's an that's an illusion right there. People are used to looking at the they're, they're used to looking at that strip aspect, and they want to set up the same aspect. But if the if the hill if the strip is uphill, um, setting up on the normal aspect might put them through trees on approach. So you need to come in steeper. Um, and and when I when I flew with my friend in Alaska, he set me up on a very high hill, like uh, about uh, six and a half thousand feet, and and um, very steep. And at that at that point, the performance of the Super Cub so lacking that you you just cannot approach that strip from below. So what you have to do is fly past the strip, determine what altitude the strip is at, and your approach can't go below that altitude. So you've got to fly in level at the strip. Then you've got to work out where you've got to go round because you can't out climb the strip. So, and that go round is going to be determined by where I can turn away from the hill and into the valley below, and be safe. So um, here in the less extreme conditions of Australia, that, you know, um, we're just looking at uphill with obstacles at either end or something like that. But, yeah, your go-round, your decision height for go-round might be 200 feet 
before landing. And once you go through that, the, these are hard and fast rules now. You know, you cannot go around. And that's why people, what I said before, that's why people need to practice, practice, practice on a safe strip, hitting their aim point. And things like that, until they, be, until they can rely on themselves to see during an approach when they're off the mark. And, and that way you can decide at 200 feet on going around. Too many people learn to fly um, on the big strip and get comfortable with flaring and floating and adding power and pulling power off and eventually scoring that breezy landing and saying, wasn't that a beautiful landing? But they've just burned up all this strip and, um, and they've got no idea that they're about to do that. They just, it just happens afterwards and they end up using a taxiway later on. And um, that's not a bad thing. I'm not knocking those people, but it's just that coming into bush flying, you have to start to refine those things out of your system and, and become very attuned to your aeroplane and you and where it's and the conditions and where you're going to hit. So, yeah. Um, and just like an airline pilot going through V1, like a lot of people don't realise that, you know, that guy sitting up the front of your jet, when he goes through a certain speed, that jet's getting airborne. So even if you're sitting down the back of that jet and its engine bursts into fire, you, you can't sit there going, why isn't the pilot putting on the brakes? He's going to take that thing airborne now, and you're there for the ride. You can sit there and look at the burning engine for the next 20 minutes. That's just too bad because he's gone through his abort point. We've got to treat bush flying is the same. You know, there's abort points and go around points, and and you've just got to be hard and fast with the decision making. Yeah. Anyway. No, absolutely. Tell me anything else to add to those points in relation to uh, risks and, or I guess, additional factors. Um. No. Look. Probably the only other one I'd add is, uh, other than you go around the port point, is the point that decide before you land the point where the power is not going to come back on either. Um, that's one that's often overlooked, I think, because once you are on the ground, if you are going into an accident, by you know, if, there, if you're at a no-go round committed past your commitment point, there is no point adding power and inertia and energy into a situation. So, yeah, certainly have the abort point where you're going to pull out of the landing but have a decision point where there is not my hands away from the throttle now. We're along for the ride. That's uh, that's key, not only in bush flying, but we see so many runway loss of control events where a decision to go around could have been made earlier. Uh, however, a decision is made too late, and then the addition of power, like you say, only uh, adds energy to that that circumstance. So yeah. I've got a, uh, a couple of videos here uh, from Tim's content that he's previously supplied us of, uh, operating in a couple of, uh, of different strips and by no means compared to what you guys operate out of sometimes are probably quite straightforward strips, uh, certainly, but, uh, gives people a, a little bit of an idea as well as to, you know, some of the, the places that you guys quite commonly fly or fly every day. Um, but I think it goes to the next point in terms of if you are going out and you're landing uh, at a new location that you haven't landed at before, what are some of the uh, the considerations or what process will you go through to determine whether that is uh, is suitable before you touch down? You want me to take this one, Dan? Either or. Yeah, mate. You, go, you start. Yep. So, look, my, my a bit of my process that I go through when I'm landing in new location, um, particularly if it's one, look, first and foremost, if I have ever have the opportunity to walk it or access it from the ground before I try landing it, I take it. It's just, there's just no, there's no if, buts and maybes about that. If it's there, I take it because why wouldn't I? Um, but say I am going into something that I haven't got uh, ground access to and I'm flying into for the first time. Um, I'm going to miss a lot of points here, I, I promise you. And even then, um, a lot of these points won't necessarily be always used in every landing. You know, you'd adjust it to um, what you want to do, what you feel is appropriate on the spot, which you work out from experience. But as we're approaching, before we start actually looking at the landing, you know, we've seen it from the air, we stay high and we start considering things like um, what direction is the sun coming from? Dan actually really skip that one. I considered it previously, but it really hit it home with me, you know, because, you know, if you've got a setting sun, you're going to have shadows. It's going to be covering things up. As you go to turn and look at the strip in certain directions, you're going to be getting sun in your eyes. So, you know, even what direction the sun is coming from, 
is is a big factor there. Then we're going to start considering things like wind direction, and I'm talking the winds aloft, not necessarily where we are on the ground. But what we're doing at this stage here is we're preparing for when we start going low level, and this is all part of your low level training. When we start going low level, that we're going to be flying safely. So we need to keep in mind that once we start going low, our concentration is going to be down there. You know, we're going to be looking down there. We're going to be focusing on points. The reality is our physical flying is going to take a bit more of a back seat. So we're going to want to have prepared and considered everything um, well in advance so that our plan for safe flight is well and truly established before we start anything else. As we start going low, um, there's going to be, we're going to start obviously looking at the airstrip. Now, the first thing I'm going to start looking at is, one of, one of the first things I'll actually identify is when I go to land, is there somewhere I can park the aeroplane? Can I pull up here? Um, can I turn it around? Because there's no point going into land somewhere and you get halfway up a hill, you're on too much of a slope that you know you can't, don't have the power to get to the top or you're not going to be able to put your brakes on. There's nowhere to turn the aeroplane around. Like You might have to physically, get, if it's really tight, you might have to get out of the plane and turn it around physically, which means you won't be able to put the brakes on. So is your plane going to roll off down the hill? You know, we're going to start looking at things like uh, and uh, parking the plane and then takeoff. So Dan was talking before about performance of an aircraft. Well, my plane on pretty well day to day, you know, I can always shorten it up. But on my standard operating, I'm normally landing somewhere from 12 to 20 meters, which is fairly short. But my takeoff is somewhere from 30 to 50. So just because I can land there doesn't mean I can get out again. The other thing about my slatted wing is it's great, great party piece flying in slow, but it also means the plane climbs about as, as well as a lead balloon. So it doesn't climb well. I've got a, quite a small engine in my aircraft as well. I'm only running an 80 horse in my plane. I'm really relying on the prop. So I don't climb out super well. So we're going to start, once we've identified that it's safe, so we've you know, gone through our low level training, which is where we're looking at power lines and everything, and I'm not going to go down that route. Uh, that's really, I say to everyone, do your low level endorsement. But we're going to start looking at things like flying down the strip and I'll start higher than lower, particularly if I've got trees. And I'm going to do a few of these passes and I'm going to be rolling, uh, flying at a, roughly my rotate speed. And where I'm at, what I feel my rotation point is, I'm going to go full power, power and do a simulated takeoff and find out, work out how good my performance is there and then. If I go into this spot, am I going to have the power to power out of it? do it a few times and work my way down. So I'm pretty well on the runway. Wheels are still off the ground, but I'm going to be just about in my takeoff position and just making sure I have the power with margin to get back out again. So we've established now, we're working out how we can take off. I'm going to have established as well all my alternatives because there's no point trying to land to take off from somewhere without knowing what your alternatives are going to be if something goes wrong. Um, so yeah, landing, we've par parking, we've done takeoff, now we're going to start focusing on the landing. So I'm going to be doing a number of things like flying down the sides of the strip more so than just on top of it because going if you go straight over the top and you're looking straight down, you're not going to be able to see holes or undulation in the terrain. A lot of the time, logs will just look like they're a flat part of the ground. So by coming from the side of the strip, it's a lot, actually to ease, a lot easier to identify uh, anything that's on the strip. And it also gives you an opportunity particularly in trade areas. A lot of my flying is in a bit of tiger country. Um, if there's going to be kangaroos or cattle or anything in the area, they might be in under the trees. So it gives me a chance to look in under the trees. You know, you can see on the strip very easily, but what's in the area. So checking above, but also down the sides of the strip. So that's, you now we just check the general surface. We're going to start working our way down now, getting closer and closer to the strip, uh, feeling for turbulence, uh, what the wind's doing. In terms of um, wind direction, one of the things I like to do is fly over the strip in every direction and watch, you know, if you've got a GPS, beauty of the GPS era, is you can watch your ground speed. If I'm what's my ground speed when I'm flying that way? What's my ground speed when I'm flying the other way? Well, that's going to give you a fair indicator of your airspeed. Also, checking going across the strip because that'll give you your crosswind factors too, um, quite accurately there. Uh, we're going to start dragging the strip. And a dra strip drag, if it's a if it's a two-way strip, I might add, one ways dragging for obvious reasons gets to be a bit of a problem. Um, but we're going to be checking for the surface. So, you know, a lot of the time, the surface condition 
might be pretty obvious if you know the country pretty well. But you never know. I have been caught out by areas that I fly in very regularly on terrain that I know very well. And there's been soft spots. It might have been a boggy spot, a bit of a spring, a bit of sand, whatever, on the strip. So running, I tend to like to do just one wheel with a light bit of pressure, keep a bit of flap back. So I've always got something that I can pull out to help me pop up. And we're going to check the surface. Um, we're really wanting to make sure as well that the area we're dragging is the area I'll be operating in. Um, there's no point dragging, you know, the first 30 metres of the strip and landing in the last 30 metres of the strip. Um, but, yeah, so we're checking now the surface. Uh, and then so now we're going to start actually planning out the approach. And stall flying is not about the landing. Everyone talks about a short landing. Stall flying is all about the approach. You don't get a short landing without a good approach. Um, so now we're going to really start planning the approach. Again, what factors are we going to have to consider? We're going to want to do nice steep. I, I love steep approaches. I'm completely with Dan. I am not a fan of dragging it in at all. I know a lot of people say there are times and place for it. My personal opinion is no, there's not. Um, so nice, steep, long, stable approach. And deciding where, before we start that approach, we go and decided our commitment points, going to work out already where I'm, you know, that point where I'm not going to be putting on power anymore, going to plan what I am going to do if something goes wrong, either in the air or on the ground. Because, you know, if you're landing somewhere isolated, you could be completely by yourself. Is your mate flying with you? Is he able to land where you are? So what am I going to do if something goes wrong on the ground? And it was planned all this out. And we're just going to start our approach. And then that really takes to probably one of the other really important things. Any time during this process, if in doubt, there is no doubt. If it doesn't feel good, if it doesn't feel safe, if it doesn't feel like I'm going right on my aiming point exactly the way I planned it, I'm going to go around and try again. Um, because there's no, you know, if, if things are, what is Greg Miller said, if you're not 99.9% .9 sure that you're going to land a spot without um without you know safely and comfortably and well then it's just not worth doing so uh we're going to make sure that we're well within our margin and you can always come back another day so that was believe it or not the very brief version of what will go through as i said you'll um you'll tune it to any particular spot that you're going to um but yeah you can see this it's more about the thought process um, and the planning in advance is the key to success in off the airport flying more than the flying itself. Absolutely. I think uh, the key there for people who haven't done bush flying or don't have a lot of experience in that space is that so many of those concepts will be new to them, uh, which comes back again to why it's important to, to get that training and to build those skills slowly and gradually. Uh, and hone those skills before you go putting yourself in a situation where, you know, there's no getting out of it safely. Dan, did you have anything else to add uh, to those points there? Yeah, only some minor things like um, Tim. Tim's pretty much covered everything. Naturally, being a, a nerdy Air Force type of that, I have to put it into a checklist. Um, I, I sort of combined two checklists where, you know, I got the stuff that, from Alaska, um, but then I also... Um, did a bit of ag rating stuff with the Fosters down at Lean Gatha and they had this checklist wish stand which was the ag flying checklist and I thought well these guys are the expert at going low level so where I consider our bush flying low flying um, because we're not at an airport and all that stuff that I said before um, I thought why not use their checklist but just take out all the ag flying components of it and, and it actually worked in really well with what I learned off day in Alaska. And the funny thing is, is I was kind of shocked at my friend in Alaska who's, you know, like they're real bush flying experts in Alaska. But one thing they don't do is look for hazards like power line. And at the end of the training with him, I said, we just did all this flying and you never once talked about looking for power lines. He goes, oh, there's no power lines out here. And I thought, oh, gee, you know, and the thing is, is like, I'm from Australia. The other student, another student was from Israel. There's a lot of power lines in Israel. And it's and um, another guy there was from Wyoming. And there's a lot of power lines in Wyoming. So, yeah. So, anyway, my little checklist involved looking for those hazards too. So, basically, yeah, I just stepped through a process via a checklist 
that's easy to remember that covers everything Tim just talked about. But basically, yeah, I check the wind. I, 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 um, I identify the area I want to land in and use that as an anchor point. Um, the sun angle, yeah, the sun angle, um, Tim covered that pretty well, but yeah, the sun angle's good and bad, you know. So a low sun is bad because it gets in your face. It's great because it gives you shadows to work with. It's bad because it gives you shadows that covers things up. Um, a high sun angle is great because it doesn't get in your face. It's great because it shows power lines from above, um, but it doesn't give you any shadows. No sun, as in twilight or cloud cover, is bad. That's it. <laughs> it's like for all the advantages of not having the sun in your face, no sun, twilight or cloud cover, people don't, if you don't realise it, you don't realise it. It comes back to that if you don't know it, you don't know it sort of thing. But once you realise it, so everyone listening now, if they didn't realise this, hopefully you'll go out and look at this now. But flying at twilight or with cloud cover, when you've got no sun and no shadows, you've got no depth perception. Like your, your, the way our eyes work, basically you lose some of that. In, all those little shadows and details that you get because of the sun, when they're gone, you don't get it. And so you can sort of, um, you lose that depth perception. So, and I'm not just talking about the worrisome wombat holes and that that we might hit, but a whole bunch of things that we need to help us judge that approach and everything. So, um, you know, kangaroos, they blend into the ground really well um, when it's just grey kangaroo on grey dead Australian grass and that. And so it's really nice to have the sun to cast the shadow off that six foot tall kangaroo, you know. Um, yeah, anyway, hazards, power lines. Are of course the big hazard that we all love talking about and Tim's done some great work with the power line people in New South Wales and that in getting things published where you can look at power lines and everything but there's no um, it doesn't matter how many power line maps you look at or anything but there's many an ag pilot will say yeah the farmer drew a power line map for me but they still went and hit a power line that the farmer didn't draw or it wasn't quite in the place they thought it was going to be um, or they just forgot about it hence the stickers on a lot of dashes of ag claims We lost Dan. I think we've got you to cut to out again. Find those, oh, there we that's go. A, we, that's a huge discussion. But you need to find the power lines. You need to work out where they go. You need to remember that and all that stuff. Um, the other hazard, though, that people forget about is dead trees, or they don't know about yet. And that's um, dead trees are nearly as bad as power lines. They they've got grey bark or no bark, and they're grey. They 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 play that depth perception trick on us again. You can have a dead tree in the middle of a paddock 600 metres from the live tree and it looks like it's up against the live tree and you're flying along and bang, you hit a dead tree. And there's, you know, like I've had an ag pilot friend knock his wingtip and aileron off on a dead tree that he just didn't see coming. Like it was just on a grey soil paddock and he, it just came out of nowhere and ripped his aileron off. Um, so you, dead trees are really bad and I've got a great little demonstration point here that I use with my students on the side of a hill where there's a bunch of dead pine trees and on from certain angles with the sun, you can't see them. And the side of that hill looks so inviting to land on. And when you get, as you get closer, these trees eventually appear and there's about 20 dead pine trees in front of you. And um, yeah, um, the last bit of my checklist, E and D, is emergencies and escapes and then the direction. Tim mentioned it, but as you're flying up high, that's a good time to look down and think about your escape paths. Before you're down there practicing those low overshoots and stuff, think, and this is part of the low flying syllabus with me, you've got to, before you get down there amongst the weeds and there's trees rushing around your head or whatever, you've got to know what's over the other side of those trees. Like my runway here at Wings Out West, from on the ground you can't see any escape paths. The, the takeoff here looks death defying. You think if the engine fails, I'm going to die. But I, I tell the students, you know, it's okay. We can turn left and, and on this runway and on the other runway we can turn right. And when they get up in the air, they see it. There's a clear path down through the trees. But from the ground, you can't see it. It's no good, um, you know. So you've got to, you know, while you're up high, find those escape paths and brief them to, to yourself. Just like a before takeoff brief. As you go to go down into the low level, say, I'm going to run along that strip. If my engine fails, I'm going to break right into the trees there. I've got a gap down there. 
you know. It's briefing. It's all about briefing the next event. Like when I was flying in the Air Force, when we fly an instrument approach, we always brief the next event. Not what we're doing. It's no point. What we're doing right now, we're in it. And we've only got milliseconds to do something about it. We need to, we need to brief the next event. And if we've got the brain capacity, brief the event after that. And, and always be extending out in front of yourself. Um, direction. Direction of, direction of inspection is important. You want to inspect out of the sun, like down sun. You want to inspect downhill or across hills um, and stuff like that. You want to inspect in an area that the wind, the rotors off trees and that aren't going to kill you while you're busy looking at the potholes in your ship. So the direction of your inspection is the number one priority when you're flying. The direction of your landing. You want to land uphill. Look, uphill is the priority over wind. Then wind becomes the next priority. Um, the sun becomes a priority, but I'll tell you what, I'll take a crosswind across the paddock before I'll, you know, like, I, if the wind is coming directly out of the sun, I'll take a crosswind before I point myself into the sun, you know. Um, limit, keep your, stick to your limits though, don't take a 22 knot crosswind in the plane that can only take 10. You know, if you've got to land into the sun, you've got to land into the sun, but just do your inspections out of the sun first. Um, the... Um, and then, while you're airborne, think about the takeoff. As Tim's laboured this point really well today, but it's no point going into a spot and discovering you can't even park the aircraft in some cases. Um, and I, I've done it myself. I'll put my hand up and say, I've landed on the side of a hill and I've been stuck on the side of that hill for about 10 minutes with the engine running, thinking, oh, <laughs> I can't turn around. Like, you know, and look, uh, it's a terrible thing to have to admit to however many people are watching today but you know i've done it and you know, it's just one of those little gotchas the hill didn't look as steep it didn't look that steep as i was approaching it and then after i landed the cub was just stuck to the side of the hill under power and and it becomes a real you know concern about how you're going to turn it around and get back off the hill anyway obviously i worked it out i'm here to tell the tale um but yeah you need to you need to have that take off nutted out and, and once again, the takeoff might be in a completely different direction than your landing. If you're landing on a hillside, the takeoff's going to be 180 degrees out from your landing. So you need to go back down that path and have a look at those takeoff escape routes. If all you've looked at is your landing escape routes, and then you land, and then you're on the ground looking at the trees around you, oh, damn, now you don't know the takeoff escape route. The beautiful thing about landing, though, and, and working the takeoff out is, though, you've got one distinct advantage with the takeoff. You can shut the plane down, chop it, tie it down, and you can walk it if you have to. So um, it's more if you're doing takeoffs and landings at a place and you want to just keep going, you really need to know the takeoff from the air. But um, there's one final footnote I'll put to this on the takeoff, and it's one thing I teach my students with precautionary landings the takeoff is optional. So we have to land the plane. Once we're flying, we're committed to landing. We're stuck with that. Um, unless you're flying a Cirrus or something and you can just pull the chute, um, we're, we're committed to landing. Sorry, I'm having a crack at Cirrus people as usual. Um, but, yeah, but we can, we're committed to landing every time we go flying. But the takeoff is totally optional. So um, even, in, even in bush flying where we voluntarily landed somewhere, it wasn't a precautionary landing. We didn't land there because we were running out of daylight or whatever. If you land somewhere... And then you stop and you think about it and you realise that you've goofed up or in the precautionary landing case, you've done a good job, you've landed there, but now you're in a situation that uncomfortable taking off in, don't take off. It's simple. I, I tell all of my students, for the work involved in taking a flatbed trailer out and pulling the cup apart in a paddock somewhere and bringing it home, is a lot easier before it's got grass and dirt and bark and shit caught up in all the parts we want to we want to pull that aircraft apart undamaged and bring it home you know and i don't want someone's guts all through the instrument panel like it's let's be blunt um the takeoff's optional so don't don't force that issue we can always discuss it we can always come up with a better plan and if the plan is to just pull the aircraft apart and bring it home on a trailer we'll do that i it's just that's just part of bush flying that's part of emergencies you know um, if it's a precautionary landing that put you in that paddock, it's just part of the deal. You got away with it, you're alive, the plane's a little bit damaged or undamaged, 
let's let's call it quits at that. So with the bush flying, I treat it the same. It's not an emergency, but I landed in this paddock. Now I'm embarrassed. I realise it's a bit soft. The grass is longer than I thought. The trees are taller than I thought. The day's hotter than I thought. Um, let's just, you know, I've got to make that embarrassing phone call. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Just a bit quickly, a bit further to what Dan was saying as well in terms of planning and takeoff. If you're going somewhere that's off airport that you're planning on being for an extended period of time, so you might be going in in the morning and take off in the afternoon, make sure you factor into your planning what the likely weather is going to be later in the day and always add a larger margin. Um, that's I, I know that's one I've, 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 yeah, I've probably come closer to being caught out by where I had a forecast and it was nothing like it and I hadn't really factored in the potential for what the weather could have done over a full day. You landed early in the morning and went to take off late in the afternoon. And, um, yeah, the wind had completely reversed. And, and I did have enough margin in the end, but it was a lot closer than I would really like to see. Um, also, another one, if we go back up, Janet said, um, asked about aiming points. Are we using the same aiming point um, as, as our touchdown point? Uh, I'm going to answer and say yes in that because when we're doing a behind the drag curve approach, we've effectively got no flare. Like you do have a flare and when you go do your off airport training and some proper stall training, you'll learn what that means. But for all intent purposes, there is no flare and I'll pick a point on the runway and my wheel is, you know, I'll be from the, my entire distance of my approach, I'll be holding a steady angle pretty well to where that wheel touches the ground. Uh, with no more than a couple of feet margin. So, yes, our aiming point is our touchdown point. Good Thanks, answer. guys. There's some uh, some fantastic advice there. I particularly like the you're not committed to take off uh, again. There's a common saying, you're better off to be on the ground wishing you're in the air than in the air wishing you're on the ground. By the time it gets to that point, it is too late. There's no going back. You are committed. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really, really great stuff. Um but talking about being committed or when things might go wrong, um, what are some of the safety equipment considerations that you guys uh, <coughs> employ? And I know you're uh, both reasonably big on this stuff um, because you've seen it in action and, and you've seen it save lives. So handing over uh, on that with a good safety message as well. Helmets, 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 and helmets. Helmets. Yeah. helmets. And, um, you know, if you're really... You know, if you really get into it, cotton clothing, long clothing, like, um, uh, you know, we like to be comfortable. And, and let's face it, we're recreational flying all that. So, you know, if you if you want to go flying in, um, if you want to go flying in shorts and a T-shirt, that's up to you. But if you, if you do see what you're doing as a higher risk thing, then, um, you know, then just take those few extra precautions. The helmet, though, like above, uh, and a friend of mine goes flying with a helmet on and is, um, gets, you know, puts photos on Facebook and he's in a T-shirt and shorts. And, you know, people will come on and criticise him. Oh, you're in T-shirts and shorts, but you've got a helmet on. Well, yeah, OK, he could get burned, but he's not in the Air Force here or something. He, he, no one's telling him what he has to wear other than, you know. He's taken that safety precaution of a helmet. At, at least the helmet's going to stop you getting knocked unconscious. And... Um, and whilst you may get some flash burns in your shorts and your T-shirt, at least you've got your senses about you to get out of that fire. So, yes, you can go all the way with the whole flying clothing thing, and I generally fly in long pants and, and two layers of cotton over my chest area um, and that just just to for that bit of fire protection. And, you know, and I have been on the ground in an aircraft on fire, so I, I sort of feel that besides my previous training in, in safety and that that I've got a good excuse to be a little bit safe um, but the helmet thing too in one accident I had I came out of with a very big um, bump down the side of my head um, from the sideways movement in the accident and banging my head into the side of the aircraft and I was I, I, I wasn't knocked unconscious but I was probably the next closest thing where I was I was very stunned and very confused even after I got out of the aircraft, not really exactly sure of the um, procedure of how I got out of the aircraft. Um, 
but then the student told me that I kind of dragged him out very abruptly. Um, and I said, well, I don't really remember that, but you know, it was a big bump on the head. <laughs> so um, you think, so it, it, it makes me think now to this day, uh, you know, and, and getting back into wearing helmets again, because I'd only stopped wearing helmets before that because the helmet I was wearing gave me a headache. And that, that I, I got onto good, comfortable helmets and um, got back into my helmet wearing after that accident because I thought if I was unconscious that day, I definitely, I definitely would have got burnt, but my student, from the sounds of it, may have just sat there in shock and got burnt too. So um, now that's, you know, that, that actually happened at an airport flying normally. Um, you know, that, that's just a freak accident. But with the bush flying, um, particularly where you're not in that airport environment, and you're not necessarily got lots of other people around that might be watching and fire trucks in town and all this kind of stuff. You really want to take those extra precautions because there may not be people around to help you. Um, a, a little ad there. When you go bush flying, it's a really good idea to go with a friend, you know, in another aircraft. Like, it's good good to do this stuff in company so as you're not out there by yourself. Hurt. But that helmet's definitely going to help. Um, PLB. The emergency located transmitter in a lot of aircraft. Um, I, I don't believe they're the, the duck ducks. In fact, I don't believe in them at all. Um, there was a horrible accident out of Sydney years ago where the two guys crashed up a valley. The aeroplane got burnt. They got badly burnt. They were alive for several days after it, but no one could find them because the beacon got burnt. Um, that was the old 121.5 beacon. The 406 beacons get a message out pretty quickly. However, that crash I had at the airport my 406, my 406 beacon was burnt, never got a message out. So if that if that accident happened in the bush, would have done me no good at all. Um, yeah, I, I really um, strongly believe in the PLB, and the PLB is only useful if it's attached to you. When you get out of that aeroplane, like I said, when I got out of the aeroplane in the accident I had, I don't even know how I got out of the aeroplane. I just magically appeared 100 metres away from the aeroplane. You don't want to go back to that burning wreck and try and dig out your PLB. Wear it on your belt, wear it on a life vest, whatever. Just have it on you. Um, I do use a spot tracker in all my planes as well. Spot tracker's questionable. Um, it seems to have been 100% reliable lately, but in the past, the reliability was a bit questionable. Oz Runway tracks people, Avmat. Have maps good at tracking people. ADSB is getting pretty good at tracking people. So, you know, there's lots of things like that also tracking us and it'll give away our last position. But the PLB, in the end, setting off a PLB will instantly give AMSA that satellite position. And um, a good ad for that is um, I rang up my friend in Narrabri that I sold a legend cub. I said, Hey, mate, you've got an American um, registered ELT in your aircraft. You've got to pull it out, send it to Bankstown and get it registered in Australia and get them to put the code in it. So my friend pulls the ELT out and, you know, um, being a curious farmer as he is, he just flicks it to on briefly and back off and thinks, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Anyway, in the time that my friend has to walk 50 metres from the shed to the house, his wife, May, comes out and says, hey, I've got someone on the phone and he knew straight away what it was. AMSA have run, so AMSA have got his position from that brief on back off. They've gone, um, they've rung the FAA and said, this beacon's gone off, but it's registered in America. The FAA have rung the previous aircraft owner. The previous aircraft owner's rung Legend Aircraft, and Legend Aircraft has given AMSA the number of my, my friend. <laughs> and... And that, and, and it was all within the time he was walking from the shed to the house. So now that's a that's a built-in beacon, which I just said were horrible. But um, a 406 beacon, like, and the same thing's going to happen with your PLB. Though the, the second you flick that thing on, the message has gone to the satellite with your GPS position, and they know where to find you. And it's that quick, and that's how efficient Amper is. And that's also the difference between a spot tracker and a PLB. Um, another friend of mine used a spot tracker in a motorbike accident and there was all kinds of worries finding him um, because the spot tracker SOS doesn't go through the same channels as the PLB goes through. The spot tracker SOS went to somewhere in Houston and then 
he was actually in the Euston reporting area for the police. They got rung and they said, oh, no, he's not in our area. So they handed it over to Broken Hill. And there was a misinterpretation with him being south of Ivanhoe. As, he was south of Ivanhoe, I think. He can correct me if I'm wrong later. But it was reported that he was north of Ivanhoe, which was the Broken Hill area. So the Broken Hill police were out looking for him north of Ivanhoe. Meanwhile, he's busted up south of Ivanhoe. And it took a long time for this to be resolved. In the meantime, he had several opportunities to die of his injuries, but fortunately didn't. Um, and that, that just came down to the way the path that your SOS goes through with a device that's um, a subscription device as opposed to an official device. The official PLB that we have to, to get registered and get, and everything goes through the correct channels. And as an answer, I've got to hand it to them that with what they did with my friend up at Narrabah, they are so unbelievably quick and um, and and accurate with what they do. So, yeah, you have a PLB. It's uh, it's certainly good advice. We had a presentation from MSA earlier today, actually, and um, certainly some keys there. Make sure your PLB is GPS fitted as well. Otherwise, that search radius is much larger, and it might take a lot longer for them to. Uh, to be able to find you, um, but also they couldn't emphasize more. If you're in an event where you think you might be in trouble, activate it. Um, they don't care if there's a false alarm or you uh, you deploy it during an engine failure, you touch down safely and you don't need it. Uh, they don't care. There's no charging for it. Uh, there's a bit of rumor around occasionally that if you activate it and they uh, start a search and rescue, you'll get the bill for it. That's simply not the case. So no. certainly uh, a good advice there. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm conscious of the time because um, we've gone a little bit over, but uh, it's a really great conversation. Um, linking to safety and equipment and, um, and the use of helmets and, and experiences. Um, I just got a video here and an experience that uh, that one of our members did have, um, and I know Tim's done a, a an in depth review video of uh, of this accident here, um, and we we thank uh, the pilot of this very much for allowing this uh, material to be shared, uh, not to point out his wrongs, but to learn from this moving forward uh, and to gain skills and experience to try and avoid these types of events happening again. But um, I'll just play a little video here, and, and I apologise, it's, it's quite hard to see what actually happens here. Um, the aircraft uh, is operating from the right-hand side of the screen towards the left uh, along the ridge line, if you can't see it, uh, but I'll play that anyway. Now, unfortunately, in uh, the worst case scenario, this is the type of thing that we can be faced with. Um, Tim, do you want to just have a, a little bit of a chat about uh, that event there? Yeah, so that was Australia Day 2020. Um, we went up for a, uh, a fundraiser at, at Aratula, and it was a hot, humid South Queensland day. A uh, little bit of wind around. But what that accident is, is a shining example of the Swiss cheese model. There's nothing major that went wrong at any point. Individually, all these little mistakes that, you know, that when you review happened um, are all things that you wouldn't think anything of. But when they all line up, um, it turned into a serious situation. So what's happened is, so the photo that's up currently is looking down the strip. So uh, the pilot was approaching towards that airstrip. And um, he's come in probably a bit lower than I'd like to see. You know, we're talking about steep approaches. 
Um, and he's had a slight tailwind, which is all pretty standard. But because he's lower, his nose is much higher. So by doing a steep approach, we're able to lower angle of attack. Because he's dragging in, his nose is very high. His visibility is very limited. Uh, for a number of reasons, he's ended up having a bit of a bounce. And when he's come down from the bounce, landed on this patch of dirt um, on an obscure angle. And if you actually look at that image to the left-hand side of the picture, you can actually see the wheel marks. Now, that left-hand wheel, that, that's Phil that, on the strip that you're looking at that covered a, covered a hole. And the left-hand side there is actually quite steep where the fill goes down to the natural ground level. So as the wheel's gone off that side, it's taken the aircraft off to the side. And the key to look at there in that photo is, I kept pointing at the screen like you guys know what I'm pointing at here, uh, is those tree stumps off to the left. So what's happened there is that aircraft being the tail dragger has had very limited forward visibility. So there's the wheel marks there. He's had very limited forward visibility. And as the aircraft skewed, Really, he's looked at what seems to be a go-round option and um, and there's got blue skies. Now, this takes us back to that commitment point. That's why I really want to emphasise that commitment point of when the power doesn't go back on because he's put power back on and you can actually hear it applied in that video and it really does look like the plane's going to fly away and it actually does take flight again. But unfortunately, what happens is there's a small tree stump to the left there, just out of shot, where the wingtip, literally by an inch, has just clipped the top of that tree stump. And it's caused that left-hand wing to stall. And the aircraft will effectively do a half, uh, half cartwheel, slide down the tree, the hill diagonally down and sideways. Uh, the leading edge has caught a small tree and it... Um, here we go. If you listen here, you'll see the application of power again. Uh, it's coming up. Here we go. Well, here he cuts the power. Down. Power back. Front. Um, so what he's managed to do that is add inertia to an already bad situation. So the leading edges, uh, the trees come down the leading edge into the side of the cockpit. Really what shouldn't have been too bad, but unfortunately during that incident, the seatbelts come undone. Uh, we know it was originally done up because he had bruises on his shoulder and across his stomach. Uh, but whether or not it was done up properly, we will never know, or if it was a failure. But uh, either way, he's been flung into the passenger seat and his head's actually got wedged between the seat of the aircraft and the tree. So what was realistically a 30 knot accident ended up being an air pilot airlifted. Whereas if he'd been wearing a helmet, um, you know, in my review video, I talk about all the different instances and how it could have been avoided going into the accident. But when you watch the video, you do see that it is a shining example how easily it can happen to anyone. However, he would have walked away from it with his worst case scenario being trying to explain to his wife why his aeroplane's broken as opposed to being airlifted um, to hospital. And that's the difference of wearing a helmet or not. Going to the helmet thing, it's um, in Sept on September 17, 1908, in Fort Myer, Virginia, by the, a guy by the name of Sir Thomas Selfridge was actually became the first person to ever die in an aircraft-related accident. He was flying a global right and, uh, and they went in. And even back then, the first ever fatality uh, as a result of an aircraft accident was put down to the fact that if he'd been wearing a helmet then, in 1908, he would have survived. And actually, in uh, 2010, the FAA put out a study where they investigated all accidents, all fatal fatal accidents between 2004 and 2009. Uh, the second largest killer was chest injuries at 7% of deaths. The largest killer, uh, largest cause of fatalities in aircraft accidents was head injuries uh, at a massive 38%. Um, and it was put down to a minimum, minimum a third of those lives would have been saved by use of a helmet. Uh, in actual fact, only uh, yesterday, uh, within the last, well, within the last 24 hours, because it was in Alaska, I only heard today of another accident where uh, a man has a gentleman who died um, in an accident in Alaska. His wife's in intensive care. Again, neither wearing helmets. 
both have been uh, said that if they were wearing helmets, they both would be okay. So it's uh, it's a big one. It, it, helmets are a massive thing, and I don't think it's a bush flying thing. I personally see it's an all flying thing. A lot of people compare it to flying around in a 172. Well, the structure of my stores is full chromoly tube. I will put money on the fact is stronger than your 172 aluminium airframe. I'm going a lot slower, uh, carrying a lot less inertia into an accident. And okay, so I might be flying around the bush, but who's to say a 172 isn't going to have an accident at a runway? I really do see helmets as a general flying thing. Uh, they're quite, quite the amount of money people are spending on Bose headsets and light speed headsets these days. You'd be surprised how close that is going to come to the cost of a helmet. You know, it might not be the best helmet on the market, but even a cheap helmet is better than no helmet. And um, in relation to the other equipment, though, um, that we were talking about earlier with PLBs and spots, I've actually got a checklist that I've come up with, uh, and that's the piss principle. <laughs> it's have a piss before you go and have a piss when you come back. That is PLB. Do I have my PLB with me? And in this case, on my person, I actually carry a vest, which I wear a vest if I'm going out bush that has some basic equipment in it, such as, uh, you know, uh, hydro tabs and uh, things like that. But in it is my PLB. So I put that on when I'm getting in the plane, that stays with the plane. Um, and it means that if I am in an accident and I stumble out of the airplane, I have that five minute, five, ten minutes of getting myself together and trying to get around what's actually happened. Plane catches on fire, my PLB is not in it. It is with me. Uh, the other thing, though, Dan said, is if you quite feel you're going into an accident, set the PLB up before you arrive. Um, the second one is iPad, iPhone, or in my case, even I'm a Samsung man, um, but it's the i, and that's turn on your Oz runways or turn on your av plan, even if you're not planning on using it, um, they can track you with that. So even if you are out of out of range when, when you're in the accident, there's a very high chance at some point you've got a glimpse of reception and um, that will be recorded. So if your PLB fails or you're unconscious and can't set it off, that's the first point of being able to track. The second one is the satellite messenger. So that's whether it's a spot or an in-reach. Uh, make sure that's with you on and tracking. Tracking being a key word because, again, if you're not conscious and not able to set that off, um, it will all still be outputting. So that's your satellite messenger. And the last one is if you're lucky enough to have one, it's sat phone. I'm a big fan of sat phones because sometimes you don't even have to have an accident. You could just have a flat tire and if you don't have a tube, or you might have two flats, and you might not have the ability to fix it, at least you can call for help. So you don't necessarily need to call in the air, air ambulance. You don't necessarily need to call in the cavalry. But having that sat phone can get you out of those minor situations, which can turn into serious ones when, when um, if you don't have that facilities. So have a piss before you go. Make sure you've got those things on uh, with you, on your person and working, and put away, put on the charge, um, and stow correctly when you return. So piss before you go, a piss when you come back. That's, um, that's yes, yeah, some fantastic advice. I think uh, something that we see all too often is uh, we've got pilots out there who are spending thousands of dollars on flying, um, but when it comes to a piece of safety equipment that might be a once-off cost of something like $500 or $1,000 or $1,500, whatever that might be, uh, in relation to the cost of a life, that's, uh, that's really nothing at the end of the day. Um, I think we're getting towards the end of our, our time frame that we've got available. Dan, did you want to add anything to that? And I know also my understanding is that people may be able to contact you if they uh, are interested in purchase of a helmet as well. As well. Is that correct? Oh, sorry, I muted you earlier. Now yeah, try. I don't want to um, say so just, just a bit of an ad for the ad, like you're... A, in case people are worried that it's like I'm being sponsored by R.A. Oz for advertising helmets, I've, I started the whole helmet thing, or Tim started the helmet thing through BFDU, and um, and then he said, I don't want to be caught selling all these things, so then he passed it on to me. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and and it just, it's, it's easier when you've already got a business structure and, and a website and stuff, I guess. But um, I try to look after everybody and, and sell the helmet for as little profit as possible. So far, that's, to be honest, um, well, especially the first lot of helmets I sold were at less than any profit. But, um, but yeah, I, I've got Bonehead. I, I deal with Bonehead um, Composites helmets. 
and also um, they're sort of my main. They're they're the proper helmet with all the building comms and everything, and there's a few variations of them. The other helmet is um, that's very popular is the Sky Cowboys helmet, which is actually a Team Windy um, military helmet that you can then fit accessories to. And the guys at Sky Cowboys, um, John Hartz, has made these really nice um, adapters that fit the various headsets. So you can, if you've already gone and spent your money on a Bose headset and you want to keep using it, you can buy the Sky Cowboys helmet, the Bose adapters, and then fit your Bose headset up to the helmet and that, and it, it works like that. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I'm not saying these are the be all and end all of helmets, but the Sky Cowboys helmet, a cheap entry level, of, it's not a cheap helmet, it's a good helmet but, um, for what it is, but as far as aviation is concerned, it's a low price entry level sort of thing that you can then put your own headset onto. The bonehead helmet's getting a little bit more up there in price and it's um, varying from the basic 5X helmet then you can buy an Aries helmet that's got like light speed or Bose headset built into that. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of other survival equipment you can have and everything. And, but yeah, we're running out of time today. That that's another. We could talk for another several hours just on survival equipment and all that. But, but for the flying perspective, we're just touching on those highlights. But yeah, um, I, I better not add too much more. But just as far as that accident, we've just looked at. Yeah, there was a similar accident with my plane last year out on hire. It just really, you know, um, just came down to, it wasn't really a bush flying accident even, but it just just comes down to that thing of decisions. You know, it went, decide when to go around, decide when, decide before it happens when not to go around anymore. And, and you know, um, um, really, um, yeah, uh, if I can say, like, my final thing is probably practice, practice, practice. You know, um, practice those approaches in a safe situation, like at an airport. Get strict on yourself. Set an aim point. Make sure you can land in that aim point. If, if you're landing on a tar runway with nice painted markers, aim for the, you know, 500-foot markers and, and just see that you're landing in that, you know, within that paint. You've got that big painted markers along beside you. Just out of your peripheral vision, see that you're touching down in that zone. That's a good start. Like, it's a pretty long zone. But if you can start touching down in that zone all the time and not floating past, that's great. Then start, as you as you get better and better, you start going back up your approach and really picking on the little things. And my students pop it all the time, the poor buggers. I'm always nitpicking something that happened way back here that caused the problem down here. It's... Very rarely does someone just randomly do something dumb at the bottom of the approach. It's It always started way back up the approach here where they just dropped the nose as they turned base or something and 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 um, gained that extra speed while losing a bit of height and, and then everything was just out of whack there. So, um, yeah, get good with your airplane's departure performance. Get good, you know, like a thing like a cub doesn't really have much in the book in the way of performance figures, so there's not a lot to learn there. But, but start studying the aeroplane's performance figures. Get If you can't calculate um, density altitude on your on your whiz wheel, get the app on your phone that gives you density altitude. You know, Start taking an interest in density altitude. It's an interesting subject that most people just ignore because they're taking off on a big runway. But here... I talk about it all the time. Um, it's not in summer here at Dubbo. It's nothing at all to have a density altitude of four thousand eight hundred feet. And when you're in a low performance aircraft with low horsepower, um, and I include Cubs in that, like they're not a, they're not a king air. Um, and when you've got a non turbo corrected engine, density altitude is everything. It affects people way more than they realise, but they'd never notice it because they're on a big runway. Um, Learn how to land, learn how to land with tailwinds and quartering tailwinds and stuff like that. If you want to go bush flying, you're not going to get to choose to land in the wind all the time. Just, it's, it sounds, it's, it, look, I've probably put something dangerous out there. So just, um, just think about what I just said. Don't go out tomorrow and land with a 15 knot tailwind and crash your plane off the end of the runway and ring me up and tell me what a t jerk I am for telling you to do that. Ease your way into this. Get instructor's advice. Work with an instructor if you're very unsure, like you're unsure at all about what I just said. But ultimately, yes, we always recommend that you land into wind. But if you're going to go bush flying, 
Um, it's a bit like ag flying. A lot of the time, those strips are one way and you need to learn to cope with various winds and that. Um, in the end, know your limits. Know your aircraft's limits. Um, know the rules, I guess. And pick the most limiting thing out of those three things and work to that limit, you know, or within that limit, I should say. Try not to work right up to your limit, but work inside the most limiting area. And, and um, because you're in an area now in bush flying where you're making, you're actually making a lot of your own rules. You don't have an en route supplement. There's no standard operating procedure for that paddock. So you have to, you have to find a set of limits and make them up for yourself and, and work by them. But I better shut up because we'd just be here all day. But that's probably but, my selling, that's my end point is just limit yourself. Like start, take it easy, have limits. Yeah. That's great advice, Dan. My, my words would be, if in doubt, there is no doubt. There's always tomorrow. Uh, that's a good limit. <laughs> yeah. And and the other one I would like to add is, Paul, going back to Paul Klaus again, is rule of three that he has, which I, I, I swear by. We were talking earlier about all the different stages of checking the suitability for a spot. Um, but the rule of three is if at any point you have to do something three times and you're still not sure, you don't do it a fourth. So if you do three approaches into somewhere it still doesn't feel right, you don't do a fourth. If you're looking at something three times and it you're not sure if it looks right, you don't do a fourth. Because the fourth time, all you are doing is convincing yourself. So if you do something three times, hard and fast rule, you don't try a fourth, you go away, you can always try again another day. Yep. It's Some of the best advice policy. I think we've... Absolutely. Some of the best advice we've seen today. 27,000 miles off airport line. So he's a good man to go. Uh, a lot of these uh, the skills that we've been through today apply with all levels of flying, uh, but certainly there's a whole lot there uh, and a whole lot of additional skills that you guys have built over the years, uh, but also that extra level level of consideration that uh, that you make in all of your flying. So um, we could literally talk about the subject for hours. Um, We've already gone well and truly over time, but it's the last session of the day. So uh, that was a really great chat. Um, I would uh, even say I think that was our best presentation of the day. Um, so thank you both so much for joining us. Um, it, it's really great to see your enthusiasm as well. Um, people who just love what they're doing and getting out there and flying. Um, so please uh, reach out to, uh, to well, Bushflies Down Under is obviously a, a huge group to follow. Um, Dan's obviously an instructor out there at Win Wings at West. Please get the right experience before you go and try all of the stuff yourself. Um, but thank you both so much for joining us, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for asking. Podium. Thanks for everyone listening. Yeah. No worries. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Yeah. All righty, guys. So thanks for those who have stuck in uh, a little bit over time or quite a bit over time for that one. Uh, but I think that was a fantastic discussion uh, to wrap things up for today. Uh, once again, before we finish up, I'd just like to thank our National Safety Month sponsors. There was a bit of talk there about spot uh, and in-reach type devices. Garmin will be presenting tomorrow afternoon where you can ask further questions in relation to that technology, and they are our gold sponsor for today. Of course, thanks to all of our sponsors, we've got over $10,000 worth of giveaways up for grabs throughout National Safety Month, which we couldn't do without our sponsors. Uh, that's today's schedule that we've been through now, but we've also got tomorrow packed full of content. Uh, so please come back. There's some fantastic presenters. We've got some guests there on uh, on ADSB, on Garmin. Uh, we've got flight safety solutions coming in for our aircraft owners uh, and maintainers. So lots of great content there tomorrow as well. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate the support and uh, have a great evening.